And four hours after you eat a food is when you get the most in the urine. So that's at the peak where the most has been in the bloodstream and now has made it all the way to the kidneys and it's coming out. So that's when you're at the most toxic state would be four hours after a very high oxalate meal. And you would look for things like, oxalate gets hung up in certain tissues when tissues are inflamed, infected, or regenerating. Most of my neurological issues went away when I finally understood I needed a low oxalate diet. And my big one was... So back in 2019, I saw you in Ottawa at Keto Retreat. And yeah, I was 1.5 years into doing keto and I was doing so much research. And when you spoke, it was the first time I ever heard anybody say anything about oxalates in foods or, and honestly, your presentation blew my mind because I'm sitting there and I'm shaking my head and I, I was shocked and a bit nervous. I went home, threw all my almonds away, all my almond flour away. I stopped making keto treats. So that was like immediate. But I don't think I fully understood the gravity of what you were saying until I read the book. <laughs> and I will say that you, you, I mean, a big impact on my health, first of all, thank you, when I got, because I got rid of those initial things. But after reading Toxic Superfoods, the thing that came to me and like I, I want us to talk about is that we used to be more concerned with plants and we were wary of oxalates. You say it in the book, like we used to know this information. And now today we do things like start our kids off on high oxalate baby foods like 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 um, sweet potatoes and pureed sweet potatoes on, on top of it. It's, we don't understand, right? We don't understand that eating vegetation is hurting our health. And I want you to help people understand, first of all, what are oxalates? But second of all, like, why do they have such a negative impact on us? It's surprising that something with so much impact on our health is so unfamiliar. Most people have never heard the word oxalate. And if they have, it's because they know that it's the principal ingredient in a kidney stone. And they don't even realize, even the doctors sometimes forget that the majority of that ingredient in a kidney stone comes straight from your diet. And it comes from plants we trust, plants we promote, plants that are now have this halo on them. And so we're willy nilly, completely unaware of oxalate. It's so interesting that we're ignoring the science that has existed for over 200 years. It's just not culturally convenient. So human beings have a way of like liking what they like and sort of unconsciously cherry picking their reality. And, and this cherry picking and leaving oxalate out of the health picture is turning out to be the sneaky background problem where we're literally toxic from overexposure, from overconsumption of these foods that have oxalate in it. So yeah, you asked what is oxalate? It's a natural chemical that's easily formed in nature. It's the end product of oxidation. Plants make a lot of it, funguses in the soil make it. It can even form spontaneously in polluted rain clouds. It's a major ingredient in acid rain. And you've heard of that back in the 80s, we were worried about acid rain, right? Well, one of the major acids in acid rain is the oxalic acid. And you're never told the details. You're not even told that your kidney stone came from your diet when you get one. In fact, the doctor's just like, ah, well, some people get kidney stones. <laughs> Go home, deal with it. Maybe we'll do lithotripsy later. So, wow, it's, we're really messing up by ignoring the fact that oxalate is all around us causing various problems, but it's particularly bad to be eating it. And the younger you are, if you're trying to grow as a baby, a fetus, this stuff, one of the things it does is grab calcium makes it hard for you to absorb calcium, which is a really critical nutrient. And it makes it hard for your body to maintain control over calcium, how much is in your blood and where it is in and around cells. And that's surprisingly important. The cells use calcium to do all the work they do. Nerves are a great example of that. In order for them to carry a charge, they, they do all this Electrolyte, these are these charged ions, they move them around, potassium ions, sodium ions, thing, especially calcium ions. And if they can't control their calcium, nerves can't function properly. And that's true for every cell in the body. So you mentioned that in the book, that in Talk to Superfoods, that one of the worst things that's happening is, especially when we give children spinach, is that they're, and, and when we eat spinach, it's like it's grabbing all of our calcium. So we, we're, we're eating, and actually, I think. Spinach has calcium in it. We're eating it for the, for the calcium and then we're not getting the use of it. But how would I see that in my everyday? Like, I feel like a lot of people, when they, we talk about these things, 
if we don't like how do they see it in their everyday what are they looking for what's happening to us it's interesting because the body is making an effort to pretend nothing's wrong so sometimes you really don't pick up that these foods you're eating are affecting your well-being and your functioning and even when you're looking for food like after a while you start having little problems you start having energy issues you start having digestive issues neurological issues, things you don't even realize are your nerves, this little trouble with staying asleep or getting to sleep, waking up at night to pee, urgent urination, itching in random places, uh, repeated infections like sinus infections or yeast infections, all these things, all this kind of stuff can start going wrong. And you never connect it to foods that are high in oxalate because the foods we're eating that are high in oxalate are things like Swiss chard, bee greens, spinach, sweet potatoes, as you said, the almonds, cashews, the peanuts. These are all foods that are like, hey, they're like whole foods. They're from the garden. They're organic. They're dark. They're leafy. They're great. So you just don't think, oh, yeah, my sweet potato and Swiss chard habit is doing me. (laughs) And, you know, you could just be completely in a fog that little things. Now you're starting to get aches and pains, a little bit of arthritis, a little bit of complaining back, a little bit of TMJ, a little tooth sensitivity eye issues, eye grit, mood changes, loss of, you know, loss of your motivation, a little bit of apathy, a little bit of irritation and anger. There's all kinds of things that can show up in your life. The spinach smoothie never gets blamed. (laughs) There's a group of scientists down in Birmingham, Alabama, who gave a spinach smoothie to 40 volunteers. It it had um, some fruit in it and some spinach. It had about 720 milligrams of oxalate in it. And what they found is the urine filled up with all these nanocrystals. See, when when oxalic acid, the ion, gets from your food, from your smoothie into your bloodstream, somewhere along the way, it starts picking up calcium, some from your blood, some from your cells, some later on, maybe in your kidneys as the body's cleaning out the blood. This is a major exit route for oxalate. The body tries to pee it out as best it can. And after spinach smoothie, you're spitting out nanocrystals, which are the most toxic form of oxalate. These are calcium oxalate crystals that are smaller than fat molecules. They're very little. They have charges. They can get in and into the cell suborganelles. So all the little bits and pieces that run the cell, which are your membranes of all things, the cell membrane and the membranes of the mitochondria and so on, they're all being damaged and affected. You get oxidative stress in those cells, but these nanocrystals, cause enough stress in the kidneys, the kidneys and the various other urinary tissues start shedding cells and <laughs> from one spinach smoothie. And even more scary is that the immune cells in the bloodstream, 40 minutes after spinach smoothie. Now you recognize when you eat a food, it doesn't instantly get into your blood. The stomach is processing it and it's passing through the stomach to the intestines and it takes a 24 hour ride to get all the way out of the system, right? So it's pretty remarkable that only 40 minutes after you eat the smoothie, that the circulating white blood cells, which are the cells that are attempting to protect us from infections and other problems, no longer are happy. They're now inflamed and they're putting out pro-inflammatory chemicals and they're ill-equipped to handle infection. So already 40 minutes after a smoothie, you've limited your ability to prevent sinus infections, yeast infections, you name it. We ate that spinach smoothie to get healthy. I'm confused a little bit because we keep, when I first read about what was wrong with me, I had a hip inflammation issue, what I figured out. And the the prevailing talk on the internet or that I found was that, oh, you have, um, the, sugar is causing inflammation. And so it's, it's confusing because everything I eat that has sugar has apparently oxalates. And I was like, what are, what's causing what? But I'm starting to understand from what you're saying, that immediate 40 minute reaction, like is sugar able to cause that as quickly? Like, is it both? Is it, I'm I'm confused a little bit. Like, how do I know? And how how do I help myself to like, make sure that I'm not over oxalating if everything has oxalates in it? Right, well, not everything has oxalates in it. Spinach is like the poster child of high oxalate foods. The other items in the smoothie, which is apple and a few other fruits are all low, low oxalate for the most part. So there's like in the greens department, if you're in the produce department and you're wondering, well, what vegetables? Every other leafy green is low except 
sorrel, which hardly anyone eats in the Western world, over here in North America anyway, spinach, beet greens, and chard. The rest of the greens, all the lettuces, anything green, watercress, cabbage, even kale. Kale has three times more oxalate than cabbage. Cabbage has about three milligrams per serving, kale maybe nine or 10. But spinach, a standard spinach salad is over 500 milligrams of oxalate. Chard is worse. And then when you make a spinach smoothie, part of the point is you can put four salads in one serving, right? And when you cook something like spinach, you go with this massive like six cups of spinach to cook it down to three quarters of a cup and then you eat half that. So you're eating, you know, like three or four. So even though you're cooking it, even if you're boiling it, you can leach out a little. And if you throw out the water, you can leach out a little bit of the oxalate. So that takes something that might be 2,000 milligrams of oxalate, which is a deadly amount, really ridiculous. And you boil it, you get it down to 1,500. Mm, that's no good. <laughs> so even though you can leach a little bit out of high, high oxalate foods when you boil them, it's still, it started so high, taking off 30% off the top isn't enough to do you a favor because you only need to eat more than say 200 milligrams a day to start getting really toxic with oxalate. A, a high oxalate diet, is defined as 250 milligrams of oxalate a day, which is easy to do if you use chard, spinach, and beet grains. And it's easy to do when we do uh, grains as well, right? The bran is the worst part of the grains. So if you're doing the whole grains, whether they're sprouted, soaked, or whatever, you still get a, quite a bit of oxalate. And even the refined grains, if you're eating a lot of them, they add up as well. See, what's scary to me is free, being from the Caribbean. It's like Caribbean. the plate is full of rice, <laughs> right? Plantains. It's either full, yeah, but and and yeah. So there Beans. is everything. It's um, I, cassava, cassava. I think you said also. So there's so many things that are standard diet that are high in oxalate. And if we're doing this our entire life, we're building up. So our like, like you said, our body's protecting mm -hmm. us. Right, it's storing it. The same thing it does with every other toxin we take in. It sequesters it and keeps us keeps us as safe as it can. So it's it's damaging on the way in because it's damaging tissue. But then I'm understanding it's damaging on the way out too. Even more so. So then you get double exposure. You get this ion running around causing damage, leaching minerals and so on from your body, causing inflammatory stress, damaging your immune system causing mitochondrial changes, maybe causing epigenetic or genetic, you know, expression changes. And then you've got this problem of having these, what I think of as little super fun sites, little crystals that the oxalate gets hung up in certain tissues when tissues are inflamed, infected, or regenerating. The new cells, the damaged cell, cellular debris, that's all sticky to oxalate and oxalate starts precipitating out wherever there's a little bit of cellular debris or inflammation. So it tends to get stuck in places that you've been overusing or damaging. If you just had surgery or got a cut, those tissues are most vulnerable. If you type all day, that could be your tendons in your hands. If you walk, that could be the tendons in your feet. Hands and feet and neck are really common. If you turn your head all day long, you're using it. There's a certain amount of tissue turnover in any cell that's naturally dying or any cell that's overused and being replaced, those tissues that were healthy because they're busy regenerating are places where things get stuck. And it tends to get stuck in fascia and tendons and glands. Almost everybody has oxalate deposits in their thyroid gland. So what's a poor body to do? It attempts, the immune system attempts to encase these things to keep these crystals that are attaching in vulnerable areas, including your eyes, and wrap them up in dead DNA, like they extrude almost like a slow motion Spider-Man process. They throw out their DNA and create this net that encases the crystal. And then you've got this little encasement. You think about your plug that you use to charge your phone with. It's got a, it's got a uh, coating on it, right? Because that keeps you from electrocuting yourself because there's energy running in there. Well, you can think of the wire as the oxalate crystal and the, the vinyl and plastic coating is what the body does. It coats them in granulomas, which are cells that come together from the immune system to try to deal with it and then ends up encasing it and they die. You get a package of either DNA or dead white blood cells. 
And that keeps them quiet in your tissues. You don't know you're filling up with crystals. They're just packaged away as these little super fun sites. But now if the body's given the opportunity to finally get rid of this mess, which you give it when you change your diet, you stop, you stop this constant influx that's so constant day in and day out, usually every meal, that the body has to change its physiology from protection, hold, 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 waiting. It's been waiting. It's been waiting for this moment when you change your diet. And now it has to turn on inflammation. Immune cells are the hazmat workers that go after the little super fun sites. They start spewing. They try to eat it. That doesn't work because this they're too big. So they have to spew out uh, collagenase and enzyme to break down the coatings and acid to break up the crystals. So this is being spread in your tissues, like this enzyme action and, and acid, that action is messy. If you think about a construction site or somebody, they're redoing your road surface, there's a big dust mess, right? There's a kind of a destruction process that goes with rebuilding. And so the, the reversal of the oxalate toxicity, the, the accumulation, the sort of deaccumulation process is a lot of work. It demands a lot of energy and it can cause additional inflammation and symptoms. And that makes total sense. We break it down, we rebuild, rebuild it. And for the normal person, you said that about 40 milligrams of oxalate output per day in a normal situation. When we're sick, our body's still putting out 40 because it's keeping us healthy. Am I, am I understanding that well? Like it's gonna still be around the same number? Well, you're talking about urinary excretion, how much the kidneys can handle. So the kidneys are designed to handle about 25, maybe 40. That's considered normal. If you get a urinary test and your amount of oxalate in your urine is under 40, that's considered normal. And they're assuming that means you're not loaded with oxalate, but the body's just busy holding onto it in tissues and protecting your circulating immune cells, your vascular tissue, because Having oxalic acid in your capillary beds is quite destructive to them. Uh, it's also destructive to the organs and the kidneys themselves. So the, the rest of the tissues are sort of waiting, they're holding on because they want the exit route to be ready. And if your kidneys are stressed or overburdened already, they're gonna hold on to it until the kidneys are ready to handle it. So some people though, their kidneys are so amazing, they can put out lots and lots of oxalate and they can have hundreds of milligrams of oxalate in their urine. But if you get anything over 40, that's definitely a concern. But a urine test that's saying you only have 40 might mean your body's just really good at holding on to oxalate in the other tissues. It doesn't necessarily tell you how much oxalate's in your thyroid gland and your bone marrow and your eyeballs. On my channel, I'm talking mostly to keto carnivore people like myself. And I'm trying to figure out like, what's the goal for us? Like, are we like we already made it to this point. We've taken most of the high sugar things are gone. But if I start to show signs of like oxalate dumping, what's the best option for people in our situation? Because we've already come down quite a bit. And I'm understanding from you that it's the quick come down that's making problems. So what happens if I'm here and I'm not seeing symptoms? Right. So, you know, when you go to a meat-based diet and you've cut out these high oxalate foods, at what point does the body start working so hard that you get these symptoms of clearing? It's really interesting how different it is for each individual. And I find in people who go with full carnivore and they're not taking calcium and not doing supplements, and it's just diet change they've done. They are Today's video is brought to you by My Keto Consultations. You know how to do keto, but you're having trouble just sticking with it? Book a consultation with me and we're going to get you back on track. The link is in the description. They are slower to start this where they get these extreme symptoms. Much slower, but not everybody. Some people within two weeks, those are the ones that come to my group classes. <laughs> with under a month, they're like, whoa, I'm carnivore. I'm really sick. And they're, so they were already just spilling and having trouble with that control mechanism. And I, there's no science that people are looking into this bioaccumulation process with oxalate and how the body reverses that problem when you change the diet to a low oxalate. Because science has not imagined that we all have a fair amount of oxalates, a certain degree of oxalate toxicity. And when you quit eating it, that puts you in a different physiology where the body's trying to recover from that. But what we do know from science is that every person who is poisoned with oxalate has a fairly unique clinical presentation. 
And the reason we know that is because there's a genetic form of this disease called primary hyperoxaluria. And those people are getting high oxalate from their own liver because they have genetic differences, you know, defects that is causing their liver to produce a tremendous amount of oxalic acid. And if they're not diagnosed early enough and somehow managed with, now they have new drugs that can manage several versions of this disease. But for a long time, all we could do is watch and wait until they needed a new liver or could get a new liver and a new kidney so they could carry on. Cause that, so the new liver is the equivalent of going on a low oxalate diet for them. And these patients, some of them, their only symptom for years is just a little neck pain and they start pursuing an answer to their neck pain. And by the time they find somebody, they start having kidney problems. And it's not until their kidneys wear out that they get this diagnosis because it's hard to see. In other, in the way this disease destroys their body is unique in each case too. Some of them end up kind of like a puddle of nothing in a wheelchair because their bones are dissolving out from under them or their jaw completely disappears and their teeth fall out because oxalate is sucking so much calcium and causing so much bone destruction. The, the oxalates tend to migrate to the high calcium bones and bone marrow and they all tend to get anemia because it's damaging the bone marrow, which makes your red and white blood cells. And those cells are, are kicked out of the bone marrow, immature and not great. And then they have more oxalate in the bloodstream and they're messed up. Um, but it's really interesting because even the extreme symptoms in these people show up at different ages. Some people you can tell within two weeks of life that they're sick and others not till they're one or two or five or 15 or 50 years old. So there's so much diversity going on in the body's various metabolic processes that allows the body to manage where it gets in the body, how much can get out of the kidneys, how it gets handled in the tissues, that um, the, the diversity is phenomenal. But there are such simple, simple ideas for you to see what oxalate can do and both coming and going. And that is be thinking about digestive health and bones and joints. So osteopenia, osteoporosis, bone pain, marrow issues, blood cell issues. There's probably a chance that oxalate is contributing to certain kinds of blood cancers because it tends to get into the bone marrow and affect the development of blood components. And then there's the neurological effects. For me, <laughs> most of my neurological issues went away when I finally understood I needed a low oxalate diet. And my big one was um, belching and hiccuping at bedtime. Because bedtime is four hours after dinner of sweet potatoes and Swiss chard. <laughs> and four hours after you eat a food is when you get the most in the urine. So that's at the peak where the most has been in the bloodstream and now has made it all the way to the kidneys and it's coming out. So that's when you're at the most toxic state would be four hours after a very high oxalate meal. And you would look for things like bloating, belching, headaches, irritability, and difficulty falling asleep, uh, aches and pains, arthritis, inflammation of all kinds. And so that is, believe it or not, hiccuping is a neurotoxicity sign. Because what's happening is the nerves are, are being stimulated by the lack of control over the calcium. And they're kind of in this hyper stimulation state and they're causing um, spasms in muscles. So the spasm can be a hiccup or it can be a twitch in your face or other kinds of weird tremory things. It's amazing to me because we often associate, like for example, twitching will be, like, we'll think of the person as stressed or like we don't, I don't even know what we'd say about hiccups, but all the things that you're talking about, like neck pain, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, yeah, I remember having neck pain, like that was a thing. And so it went away when I changed my diet because all my joint pains went away. But I blamed it on the sugar, right? And so it's like, there's so many things in plants that, but oxalate seems to be across the board. Like they, they have some level of it. Like all, almost, it seems like almost all plants have some level of it. You talk about in the book that there's other harmful, like the lectins and the, the other toxins that are in plants. I'm wondering, is oxalate, because it's across the board, 
something that we should be more focused on than these other things? Do you think they're all equivalent? Like, how do you look at that? Well, that was what the education of Sally has come to. Like, you come to this topic completely unaware, and then you start exploring it and start teaching it and learning from people and learning from science. And they keep going back to the science and the people, and they, they keep coming together and keep saying, absolutely, the worst problem in our diet is oxalate. Up there with margarine and, you know, things like emulsifiers and everything a factory makes for you is no good. But you can get away longer in factory foods than you can get away with spinach and switch chard. Honestly, I think some people are eating garbage food, as long as it's not potato chips, because potatoes are very high in oxalate. The potato chip is probably the most deadly food out there. It seals in the oxalates. It's very high soluble oxalate in the potato chips. Like almost 90% of the oxalate in the potato is this ionic, you know, easy absorbed. It's wrapped in deep fried toxic oil, seed oils, and potato itself is full of other chemicals too, and has almost no redeeming features in terms of nutrition. So that's one way on junk food, you can really take yourself out and end up with chronic fatigue and mood problems and energy problems and so on. But oxalates, honestly, if we could protect ourselves from that, humanity would be happier. <laughs> Children could learn easier. They would grow better. It's definitely affecting the learning and the behavior and the mood. So yeah, you're stressed. You're stressed, but maybe it's because your nervous system is stressed on this toxin. Can you talk more about the mental health piece of the puzzle? Like you, you said your mood would be better. So can you help people listening to understand a bit about what it's doing in the brain? Do we have, do we have any data on that? It's really interesting because we, we see lots of bits and pieces in the literature, like the fact that in Parkinson's disease, you find oxalate crystals in that critical part of the brain that causes Parkinson's disease. And you see this all over the literature. It's just sitting there in modern literature, but the most profound place is back in the 1840s and so on, when they talked about encephalopathy. In fact, in, in the primary hyperoxylaria literature, we see how you can get encephalopathy, which is a really dangerous a fluid buildup in the brain from being, from being a primary hyperoxylaria person. So we see it throughout. You see it in um, the use of a drug that contains oxalate for cancer, that drug almost universally causes neuropathies in those patients because of the oxalate. You see it in the original literature from the 1830s and, and 40s, where the mood, once the person got into the rhubarb thing and they start poisoning themselves with rhubarb, they would become neurotic and their personalities would go south and they would just, their whole personality would change. Um, and you see how oxalate causes oxidative stress and inflammation in tissues. And nerves are the most sensitive to oxidative stress and inflammation. And they're also the most sensitive to this electrolyte, the loss of the electrolyte control. So you put the nervous system in an inflammatory state and you get from that anxiety, depression, loss of motivation, loss of enthusiasm for life. You can get all kinds of changes in how the brain is working well, including your ability to remember your own name and how to spell and you know, perform cognitively and learn and remember. I'm, I'm curious to know for yourself, because you talk about it in, in Talks to Superfoods that you had a process of your own health, figuring this all out. I'm curious to know, where did you land in your eating? I have this, my body is the ruler and I am the servant. So I, the lucky thing about when you take the oxalate, this is probably another neurological and immune, immunological and gut effect. When you take the oxalates out of your diet, your body starts telling you what it likes and doesn't like food-wise. So you get much more, quote, sensitive or much more aware that you're not digesting certain things well. And it became obvious and then it was confirmed in allergy testing that I can't eat the cabbage family. Like I was trying to live on those vegetables because they're the low oxalate vegetables and I'm a vegetable queen and I like to do a main dish, a salad, and two or three vegetable side dishes. <laughs> like I was a maniac for vegetables. And so when I went low oxalate, I just switched over to the cabbage family because there's lots of choices. You have your radishes, your rutabagas, your turnips, your watercress, your arugula, you name it. You know, there's a lot in the cabbage department that are low oxalate, but they're also very cabbagey and they're the one family. So I'm allergic to the cauliflower and the broccoli and all that family, so I can't have it. So that taught me to take that out. And then 
uh, reacting to a lot of fruits and this and that. So it, I was down to lemons when lemons are very helpful because the citric acid bonds to this calcium oxalate and softens it and helps you to break up the kidney stones and the stones in the body and it helps you alkalize and then you have the right pH in your urine, you can put out enough citrates in your urine, which prevents you from getting kidney stones. So lemons are a critical therapy as is taking calcium, often in the citrate form because that's citric acid and that citric acid is so therapeutic. So I was eating lemons, various meats and butter and nice local butter, occasional other dairy foods and coconut products and very little plants by the time I was listening to my body. So I, in 2019, I think it was April 1st, I decided to just go full carnivore and even stop the lemons for a while. And I have since tried to build in more foods and occasionally use rice, but my system is struggling with that. And this is one of the the problems with the oxalate. If you've been like me and eating rhubarb since you were little (laughs) and eating Swiss chard since you were little and liking beets and beet greens as a kid, then you can have some long-term changes in your immune your immune cells and how your immune system works. I also made the mistake of eating slow-cooked beans in my vegan years, and the lectins in the beans helped to finish off my digestive tract and created a post-infectious IBS that never let go and caused... There's a certain amount of damage that occurs because of epigenetic changes and because the body's trying so hard to protect you that has a long tail which is why this is such an important message to get out. And you mentioned how it's so important with children for parents to be aware that this is not good for them. It, you could set up some problems that are hard to straighten out. So some of us have this sort of damaged system where the option for a varied diet starts to slip away. I have to say that what you just said makes me like, first of all, I'm sorry that you went through that to figure this out. Um, but it solidifies from myself because I, I have these joint issues that as soon as I touch too much sugar, that's what I thought it was. Like when I get to a certain number, bang, I feel in pain. And I was nervous when I, when I was reading what you're, cause I'm like, what if I have this dumping happens like a year from now? But I'm also, I guess, understanding from you that maybe there are things I could bring back in if it starts to happen to help myself through. And so I shouldn't be, I don't need to be afraid of it is what I think I'm understanding from you. If it happens, we deal with it when it happens. So, cause I'm carnivore right now and I kind of feel good. So I'm like, I'd like to stay here, but I guess what I'm understanding is if it should happen, then I deal with it when it happens. You need to know about the signs of the oxalate releasing and be prepared for that to happen at some point. Cause it, it may. And a a new YouTube video just came out on my channel and this gentleman had been juicing for decades. I watched it. (laughs) You know, and he basically went carnivore. Paul Saladino inspired him to do that. And it took a treatment with methylene blue. Like he did a non-carnivore thing and he went to start to take a supplement. And that was what gave his body what it needed to start doing this clearing. And he had a dramatic rash with crystals coming out. So I think part of what's happening with carnivores is they don't have quite the metabolic heft. They don't have the calcium and the other things that we tend to add in to support the body so that it limits the body's enthusiasm for the clearing. And so you can kind of skate and just leave things in place, which is a pretty good place to be. If you can, if you can leave the oxalates alone for a while and not get into this heavy clearing, that's good because you probably are doing, anytime you do tissue turnover, which is part of staying alive, you know, you don't have the same body today that you had five years ago. All the cells are basically pretty new compared to then. And so there's this always going to be some repair and recovery going on. You just, what we don't want to have happen is where the whole system lights up with lots of cytokines and immune activity that's like turning on inflammation all over the system and then mobilizing too much oxalic acid and repoisoning you and putting out too much oxalic acid into your bloodstream and in your kidneys. That's toxic. So yeah, the answer to if it starts happening, we start doing triple strength tea, um, some beet juice, a scoop of rhubarb, something, you know, like it does take some oxalates to tell the body, yeah, uh, mm, no, stop, slow down. And you can do that. And the one thing I still have in my diet right now is coffee. So I haven't, I haven't eliminated coffee. There's not yet. much oxalates in coffee. There's other chemicals. There's not much. Oh. Okay. <laughs> There's caffeine, which I think you'll eventually lose your tolerance for caffeine 
partially because oxalate has really messed with our livers because the liver is the first organ in harm's way after your bloodstream. So you, you eat it, it's annoying to your digestive system. It goes into the hepatic circulation that delivers everything you absorb from your food straight to your liver and floods these cells of the liver. The liver has this open sinusoidal structure that allows everything that you're eating to flood into these cells. So there's no protection in the liver from the oxalate. And the oxalate makes, I mean, the, the liver is making oxalate as part of its normal, what it does to, to do amazing liver things. And now it's dealing with more oxalate, which puts it in a certain amount of stress. It has to use all its glutathione and all its resources to protect its function. Its function is so critical to your survival. So there's a certain amount of stress in the liver that probably causes increased production by the liver of oxalate and also causes a certain amount of residual oxalate um, deposits, which are not detectable easily. They're, they're in this lipid crystal format that's not detectable in a microscope or with even chemical analysis. It's hard to see it there. And so later on at some stage in the gallbladder, the sludge in the gallbladder can be this oxalate building up. Later on, when you're trying to clean out your gallbladder and clean up your liver, your liver may not do so well on the caffeine. And, and that's, I guess, a, a function of as our body cleans up, it asks for more. It's ready for prime time. It's ready to turn you into the perfect human specimen you were meant to be versus the one that's been damaged with our kind of potato-based culture now. And peanut butter, potatoes, and chocolate are examples of non, well, not very keto appropriate foods that most people grow up on. So when we, when we get to this place where we're eating better and then our body shows us something else, the, obviously, I'm so afraid for people to say this is a reason not to do it because, oh, I might suffer in the detox process. We want to feel good, but we're afraid of pain, as most people. But the flip side of the coin, and you said this in, in, in Toxic Superfoods, and I was like, unhealthy bodies have trouble defending itself against illness and repairing itself, even if you try to give it supplements. And I feel like that statement is part of the reason that I wanted to talk to you and help people to kind of get this. If I'm walking around with all these oxalates in me and my body's damaged, when something happens, like we saw with the world four years ago, so many people couldn't manage. And I think it's partially because of this, so we're eating all of the wrong things all the time. It's damaging our bodies and we can't repair or, or we can't defend even. So true, so true. We're we're not expressing our true resilience. We're in, designed to be really tough and live outside running around with hardly anything on and weird weather and you know, we're designed to take it. But we, these days we need this sort of, what I think of as like the domesticated Persian on a velvet pillow, somebody brushing us and like, we need heating and air and shoes and special everything. Half people don't even want to chew anymore. They're, they're blending their foods and sucking it down like an invalid. You know, it's, um, it's a whole different world. We, we don't realize our capacity for strength, resilience, toughness. We haven't seen that. So the, the thing about blending our food and like not, you, you mentioned that blending oxalates makes them worse. If we're, if we're constantly juicing things, because that would be the ultimate blending of something, and then we're ramping, we're just ramping up our body's inability to defend itself against the oxalate. Yeah, and, and everything else because we're poisoning ourselves. Okay. Poisoned bodies aren't happy bodies. They're bodies that get cranky and start to struggle. One thing I want you to explain, because this, I think, again, gets a lot of people to go back to the plant world a lot, is phytonutrients. So phytonutrients probiotics, like all these terms that we are told are things that we absolutely need to be healthy. I would love for you to explain to people like why that's not completely the right direction. Yeah, the idea of phytonutrients was sort of a back of the envelope kind of shortcut idea that gained a life of its own. And in science, there's these techniques for trying to figure out the effects of things on cells that are happening in Petri dishes. They're not happening in a body that has saliva, digestive tracts, intelligence. Every cell in your body is intelligent, but it's working as a whole unit 
is a level of intelligence you don't get in a petri dish. Uh, so a lot of decisions are being made. You know, the saliva has ways to disarm things, and then the the gut is trying to manage things, and the liver is trying to. There's lots of intelligence going on there. Uh, so it's quite different the phytonutrient in a petri dish versus the ones you eat. And so there's been a lot of fantasizing that what's going on in a petri dish is relevant to your body and your diet. And we can fantasize gloriously because these foods are pretty. Look how beautiful they are. They make great magazine covers. They sell a concept of vitality and well being. They make money. And you can make money pushing this idea with your supplements and your juicers and your bullets. And so it's been very popular in magazines and in the world of marketing, which seems like everything's all about marketing nowadays. So it got picked up. And even the, the researchers are busy kidding themselves about phytonutrients and they're using techniques in the lab that gives them false positive ideas. You know, like they, they don't even understand their their technique in the lab where that's kind of tricking them. They're getting tricked too. And because they want it to come out a certain way, because they come in with the bias of, oh, plants are great. We all come in with that bias. We have been trusting plants for 400 years. And it got started like 10,000 years ago. But the last 400 years, we've really gotten in bed with this little enemy who's sneaking into our lives. <laughs> so it's in the mindset of everybody that plants are great. When in fact, if there is a positive mechanism from these phytonutrients, it's because primarily they're stimulating our own defense systems. And this is probably a similar concept to why you can eat oxalates and not feel sick on them, because the oxalate is stimulating your defense system and actually lowering inflammation because the body's busy trying to prevent destruction from the oxalates so you can eat them and feel okay. Um, so the idea that phytonutrients are an it's, uh, people get the feeling like you need these things. You must have them. No, that's an essential nutrient of which phytonutrients will never be and never have been. Um, it turns out that the few attempts at little randomized trials in human beings, there's several that show you are better off. Your inflammation levels and the, the state of your body is happier without vegetables, without phytonutrients. But that doesn't sell anything. You're not, you're not gonna fund that and continue to pursue that idea because you're gonna undo a lot of careers. There's hundreds of thousands of scientists who are busy saying they're so good for you. And that's the whole microbiome thing has also taken on a life of its own and getting ex expanded and exploded into this idea again, where you have to be a fermentation chamber. You need lots of bacteria fermenting away and protecting you and doing all these things, but we're not really designed to be fermenters. Those are the ruminants who have guts that allow the bacteria to digest indigestible cellulose. And those ruminants live on bacteria that they're farming in their, in their gut, but we're not designed to be living on our bacteria. I love what you just said, because it makes me think about when I took something out of my diet, the nightshade vegetables, and then accidentally had them, my body reacted violently. And it's like, yes, of course, it's like if all the years it's been protecting me from it, I finally give it a break of a few months or years and then accidentally have one, of course you react. And I feel like what we don't let ourselves do, or at least we don't notice in our children when they're reacting those first few times we're giving them this stuff, right? I remember my daughter just not wanting it and pushing it because that's what the doctor said you're supposed to do. And I think like it's come back full circle where it's like now we've taken it out and it's I'm seeing it in myself. Um, it's amazing to me that doctors aren't talking about this more. It's the other part that I'm, I'm a little bit, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Like why aren't doctors talking about this more? Before I mention that, I just wanna take a little biblical moment and say the children will lead. And the fact that adults are so in their head and they don't let a child innate wisdom affect our thinking at all. A, a little one-year-old is not going to affect the thoughts of a doctor, unfortunately, because we don't have the reverence for life and we don't have the reverence for our inherent intelligence that's built into us. We have to overthink everything and turn things into giant systems. And we have to deify certain professions and let them tell us how to live. And I profoundly saw this when I worked in a very poor community in North Carolina, where somebody once said there, these are old, older people, although they age very rapidly in this community because of poverty. 
and maybe too many sweet potatoes because it's North Carolina, <laughs> where the old things don't work anymore. So all the herbal medicine they know don't work anymore. They used to walk to school and grab a certain twig from a certain tree or bush and chew on it and make a little brush. And they'd use that to brush their teeth as they walked to school. I think the young people don't know which tree or twig that was anymore. It's gone because, hey, the old stuff doesn't work anymore. And that's partly what's happened is we've turned over our culture to the experts and the authorities and the people who are licensed to say what reality is or isn't. And reality is out there for us to figure out ourselves. Well said. I, yeah, I, I definitely think that there are things that my grandmother said to me that today I look and go, yep, she was right. And we need to get back to basics. And I feel like this is, so we're talking about the oxalates and you, we got to this data, some of it from old science and new science and science is not bad but we're not using it properly is what you're telling me. <laughs> right, we're not using it properly. And we're, we're picking and choosing and we're leaving the science that says oxalate's a big problem and ignoring it because it's not fashionable. And it's not money-making to just tell people, eat. well, why is it meat money-making? I guess because, yeah, but it's, it's not, not as money-making as plants. Not at all, right? And it's not as addictive and you can't, you know, you can't turn it into hyper stimulating foods that are ultra convenient and are so beautifully packaged in bright shiny packages and so marketed that we like cherish them cherish them as a way to get a break in our lives and a way to celebrate and a way to have fun and start shoving blue icing to one-year-olds as if that makes a difference in the one year if it's really a, a true celebration of getting to age one which is part of what's really frustrating too with this conversation is that we're, we're still focused on having fun with food mm -hmm. rather than using food to make us healthy and strong so we can have fun in, in real life with people and situations and, and live our life. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it causes us to make these mistakes because honestly, if we didn't have all the other garbage in the supermarket, we'd have the money to buy proper healthy food and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't need to find ways to trick us to spend money. Give us something else to spend our money on. No question. You're absolutely right. And the other thing too that you're saying is that basically we've set ourselves up for an eating disorder from the get-go because we say that we need food in order to be happy. And we use food to fill in for love and all the little holes in our psyche. We think we can fill those holes with food and it can blow up into frank uh, eating disorders that can be very difficult on people. That's another thing that's interesting about this neurotoxicity and the mental health factors. I was shocked right from the beginning when I just shared with a friend about, you know, I feel better on low oxalates. She called me back. She goes, after decades and decades, after like 50 decades or five decades, she no longer feels that she's an addict. She struggled with a food addiction and alcoholism. And she felt like the whole grip of addiction lifted and she got the toxicity out of her diet. That's something that a lot of people talk about, that going even just keto and not knowing about the oxalate part of the story, just getting the carbs down to a minimum, all of a sudden they, and I, I feel like there's so many levels on which plants are doing things that we don't understand. And, and, and we should understand because there's medicinal properties to medicine, like, like to, to, sorry, to plants. Like we know that but then we act like we don't know that. Human beings are an interesting lot. <laughs> we want what we want. We want to believe what we want to believe. Yeah. And, you know, right now we're so struggling with that on every level. But the cool thing, what's surprising to me is that a kind of complicated message about oxalate and the toxicity it causes and that there's a little bit of a long tail to get over it and all that is that people are listening. It's, I... I'm surprised. My book is selling very well. And it's because people are so excited about what it's doing for their health. They can't wait to help other people. People inherently are interested to help each other. It's beautiful. Honestly, our whole keto, carnivore, low oxalate, this whole community is rallying together to show other people that you don't have to live in pain all the time. Like, it's crazy to me. I live 23 to 46 in pain every day. And now I feel amazing. It's like people need to know that that's a possibility. 
it's great to have your vitality back and your freedom to enjoy being a physical thinking, you know, creative human being. It's fantastic. Tali, how can people get more from you? Like, what, what, Where do we want to send them next? Please come to my website. There's all kinds of orientation and information on there. And you can get a, a cookbook for people who still want to eat plants. There's plenty of vegetable recipes. What do you do with the turnip anyway? <laughs> Nobody knows about turnips and rutabagas anymore because they're not popular. But that's that cabbage family that's very useful on low oxalate diet. There you'll be able to soon, you'll be able to order um, this product, which is a uh, information about oxalate in foods, which is not needed for beginners. You don't have to have this, but when you start really tweaking and playing with it, this can be useful or people who are trying to help others in clinical settings. But you got a lot of information if you get the book. There's lots of tables and data in there. There's a table in the back, so there's a lot to be had there. But there's resources on my website. I do have this YouTube channel where people are sharing their stories and there's some little one minute things on there that I think could be handy for you to introduce other people to the concept of the oxalate. So come check, check all that out. And then you can see me on Instagram too. Wellness Warriors, thank you for joining us. This was a great conversation. I hope you got a lot of out of it. And there's a video on the screen right there that's going to help you to start a better way of eating, whichever way you choose.